Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. Um, one thing technology can't um, replace is the inability of not spilling coffee over yourself. So excuse me if I look a little bit shabby um, this morning. Um, as the introduction went, my name is Gareth Ellis Unwin. I'm the head of film and animation at uh, Screen Skills, the national agency for skills and training for the screen industries. Um, I'm also an Oscar and BAFTA award winning producer from my sort of former life. Um, I thought we'd kick off uh, with a little bit of detail about me. Why have they invited me to come and talk and uh, start this, uh, this excellent day of learning um, ahead? So I had a slightly checkered career in education and I still get nervous when I'm in a room with a bunch of teachers and lecturers. Um, so if I stumble, please forgive me. Um, I was politely requested to leave school at the age of 16 with a spray of GCSEs. And it was quite a late decision to go the uh, vocational route through a BTEC media. Actually, I'd taken my sister down to her A-level interviews and saw a bunch of people running around with cameras and a sound boom, etc., etc., and went over and had a chat with them. And had always had a passion about film and filmmaking. In fact, at the age of 14, I'd suggested to my then careers teacher that I might want to go and work at Pinewood. And she told me I was too thick. And uh, that was in the days when teachers could use language like that. So that lit a fire. And that fire has burned bright for pretty much all of my adult life. In fact, it was the same teacher that then asked me 22 years later to come back and whether I'd consider doing the prize giving evening with my Oscar, um, which I apologise for not bringing with me today. Um, so I did a HND in programme operations at Ravensbourne College, um, as was then a very good school, as is now a very good school. Uh, and graduated in 1995 with the two essential skills of knowing how to work a photocopier and a kettle. Those two things have stayed with me throughout my working life and I still make a mean cuppa and I'm never too proud to make a member of crew a cup of tea or coffee if they need it on set. Um, I started as a floor runner. It's pretty much an established pathway in. I worked for a number of companies until I got asked to actually step up to the role the first assistant director. The first assistant director is like a floor manager on a feature film. The department is the glue that sticks all of that varied and disparate workforce together and keeps you on time and on budget. I worked on 14 feature films and on about 200 hours of television. Everything from EastEnders, The Bill, up to things like early, early uh, Midsummer Murders and things like that. Um, in 2003, I set up Bedroom Productions, a banner under which I've now produced six movies most recent of which was in the cinemas just a few weeks ago with, with Andrew Scott. Um, and probably the biggest hit to date that people know us for was The King's Speech, which we found as an unproduced stage play in 2003 and took it all the way to me picking up Best Picture Oscar in 2011. But in 2018, I got seduced by the siren song of education and training, something that's a calling that you've all answered. And uh, I went into Screen Skills as then their head of film. So. Growth in screen. Why is all of this really, really important right, right now? Um, we're in a massive boom at the moment in terms of uh, production in the UK. There's some stats that are up there and we will make available the PowerPoint to, to um, Tech Pathways after today's event. But there's some really big, impressive stats there. Um, it looks like by 2020, the games publishing um, will actually overtake that of, of books to the extent of nearly 0.6 of a, a billion pounds. We know that there is a huge contribution to UK PLC in terms of uh, what the creative screen industries bring in, into the GDP GVA. We see massive growth. There's a 16% hike over 2013 to 17, and we've seen um, much higher spend rates in film and high-end TV. So 3.1 billion last year. So why is this important? Well, the reason it's really important is. There's jobs out there. There are jobs and shortages that your potential students now and in later years can come help fill. The projected trajectory is that it's only going to be um, a, a rising curve. And I sit on two government panels which are expecting that £3.1 billion um, pound figure to double in the next four years. As you will have heard as recently as two days ago, Netflix have now taken permanent offices at Shepparton Studios. And the, the, this boom that we're in at the moment creates wonderful, wonderful opportunity. For a very long time, the screen industries were sort of seen as, quote unquote, not a proper job, not a full life career. It was full of frilly cuffed liberals that didn't want to hold down a proper day's work. The truth it now is that we have a real, real need for people working across a variety of different grades, a variety of different seniority, and in the many, many different areas of the screen sector. And by screen, I mean film, I mean games, high-end TV, 
unscripted children's VFX and animation. It's a very, very broad church. So how do screen skills um, help those that are interested in, uh, in, in a career in the screen industries? We do a number of things. Um, we have quite an extensive uh, careers information holding on our website. We've recently gone through a massive audit of that information to make sure it's up to date. And there's a lot of resources that are available there that I know Margaret's going to walk you through in terms of what's available to, to you. We work closely on mapping and quality marking uh, the professional pathways in. We're very much integrated with industry. A lot of people that are real practitioners sit on our skills councils, call me up and tell me what's going on, invite me to film sets to show me the changes, and they are, it's an ever emerging space. We've built a mentoring network for those that don't have those connections in, and I'm pleased to say we've already got 491 matched pairs that are mentors and mentees that are working on those pathways in. We've recently launched our new bursary provision. Um, that's half a million pounds a year that is there to enable those that previously maybe couldn't look to our industry because of financial hardship to be able to access that as a, as a pool. And for the first time, we're actually targeting that entry level support. So previously it was only available for those that were already in the career. Um, and that goes towards unblocking the financial barriers and basically trying to create a level playing field for those that want to come in. And I wanted to show you uh, just two short cinema ads. So quite recently we had our Find Your Future uh, campaign roll out nationally. Um, if you went to see Rocket Man or Secret Life of Pets or Aladdin a few weeks ago, chances are you may have caught one of our cinema ads. But for those that haven't had chance to, to see any of them, I think they're a really good exemplar of the type of people we're working with and the type of jobs we're providing them access. And you'll see from the two case studies that I've picked that these are incredibly technical roles. Um, so let me introduce you to Shaney first. My name is Shani Bismar. I am a visual effects assistant coordinator. Visual effects is, is really diverse. There is something for everyone. If you're quite a quiet person, you're a visual effects artist. If you're someone that loves holding the room, you could be a manager. I really love visual effects. I've found a home there. We're geeky, we're nerdy, I like that. But I'm much more comfortable around the geeks than the nerds. There's women at the top, which are really inspiring. They're real powerhouse women. That is where I'd like to get to. Okay, so that's Shady, she came through our Trainee Finder programme. Um, she actually worked on Wonder Woman 1984, which has just wrapped up at, uh, up at Leavesden Studios. Um, VFX is a real boom area within a boom, boom sector. Um, the second uh, person I'd like to introduce you to is Lauren, um, who's a camera trainee. I worked as a camera trainee in the film industry. There was a time when I would sit and Google how to work in film. I thought that living in the North East would restrict my opportunities. Eventually I came across screen skills. I had nothing to lose so I applied for the training programme and it's paid off. I've been on a lot of jobs where I am the only female in the department and I'm okay with that but I would like to see more women in the camera department. Anyone can do it, grab every opportunity that you can. Okay, so Lauren, again, someone that's come through our trainee finder programme that we've been working with. Um, okay, let's get to the nub of today and um, technology and how it might influence creative teaching uh, for the 21st century. Let's actually just take a moment to think about why, why is technology important to the, the screen industries? Well, there are a number of, of key drivers to this. Um, one, we work in storytelling. We want to create that which doesn't exist. And whereas if I'm doing an Andrex commercial, I can go and get a Labrador puppy and with a smear of Marmite on the back of his pretend mummy's hand, I can get him or her to lick that hand and be super cute and I can make my toilet commercial. However, if I want a dragon to come and slay a whole tribe in Game of Thrones, then I, you know, there's no dragon handlers out there as far as I'm aware. So we use technology to create that which doesn't exist and to support storytelling. We also use technology to make um, technology safer, uh, to make the production process safer. So for example, much as many might have loved to have actually blown up MI6 on the South Bank for real in Skyfall because of the loss of, loss of the building, danger to life, danger to access, etc. It was done with VFX. So quite often there's a technological intervention that just makes the process safer in terms of production. We're always looking to enhance efficiency and productivity. So to give you a set, uh, an idea, when I was ADing on set, typically shooting on film, 
you would manage 10 to 15 camera setups a day. So 10 to 15 occasions where the camera had to move and a new piece of action had to be recorded. On average, we'd shoot on a feature film about two pages of dialogue a day. The old adage was about a, a minute of screen time is about a page of dialogue. So you can imagine the length of those production schedules based on 10 to 15 setups a day and two pages shot a day. Typically now on a feature film you're looking at progress reports that are coming out with setups numbering up to 35 and 40 and shooting upwards of sort of three, four, five pages of script a day. So the process has, has accelerated. The time on set is now much more pressured. Um, we also want to look at the opportunity to expand distribution and consumption opportunity. Um, it was a really interesting moment for me the first time I was on a train and I sat next to someone on a long journey and I saw that they'd downloaded onto their iPhone 6 one of my mo movies that I had painfully crafted over a long period of time to be designed for this beautiful theatrical experience and uh, the person in question had only one earphone in was chatting to the person that was directly opposite um, and uh, was paying very little attention to that which I had made. Um, things have really evolved and changed. I remember one of my very first jobs was working at a company called Cal, and Cal was a motion graphics company. And to render three seconds of motion picture would take pretty much three days. So we would kick off a render on a Friday night as we switched the lights off and we went out for the weekend. And we'd come in on the Monday morning with our fingers crossed, just hoping that there wasn't a crash log that said that uh, everything had fallen over at midnight on Sunday. So these are, these are the ways in which and why the screen industries um, have embraced technology. The technological advances that I've witnessed, I've been doing this since 1995, and a couple of the key ones, the massive explosion of VFX and animation. When I started out in the industry, VFX really was the, the poor cousin of the process, and if you could shoot it in camera, that really was the aim and ambition. Whereas now with the quality of VFX and then being able to recreate things like rain, snow, water, animals, um, both fantastical and real, um, there's been that real sort of boom in VFX. Um, there's been an overall shift to digital cameras and digital filmmaking and actually I'm going to case study one particular role that didn't exist 10 years ago. Production logistics have vastly improved, you know, gone are the days of losing crews and having phone calls to the location manager because they've gone to the wrong field to go and shoot a, shoot a scene. So that has really holistically changed the way in which we, we make our movies now. If you still want to try and visit a film set, the best thing to look out for is the unit signs that are stuck on lampposts with tech crew this way or, or unit base that way. We still rely on some fairly analog solutions, but the whole sort of workspace has shifted. And the volume and speed at which we can capture, transmit and share data has grown exponentially. There is a worldwide net called Soho Net, which um, encompasses mainframes in the US, in both LA, New York, London, Melbourne, which has created this global infrastructure of super high speed um, data transfer. It now takes something like 90 seconds to spit a fully formed film down the Soho Net system. I mean, it's incredible speed, and that's opened up all sorts of distribution opportunities. So the case study that I've, I've picked out to, to talk to you about today, um, when um, James and Tech Pathways approached me to see if I'd deliver the keynote, I was trying to, to rack my, my brains and think about, okay, what's, what's a really good example of how the needle shifted over, say, the last 20 years I've been doing it? So I'm just going to be slightly sentimental, I'm going to reflect a little on how we used to do things. Um, so, the old way of, of, of shooting a movie. Previously, scenes were shot on film, this was known as The Rushes. That film was then shipped in lightproof canister to the lab. At that lab, the exposed stock was developed and the telecine process took place to transfer the images to video. That's the third image to the, to the right. After the images were transferred to that video, those videos would come back normally one, two days later to the set and everyone would gather around a single monitor and watch the scenes that they'd shot two days before, trying to work out, do we have the scene in the can? Do we need to go back and do any pickups? Have we got it? Have we got Rush's clearance? So just a very extended process. Everyone would, um, would huddle around that monitor, fearful that we'd actually have to go two days back in the schedule to go and pick something up. There wasn't that immediacy. Um, and once we'd got given Rush's clearance, the, the word would go back to the lab that the Rushes were clear from set and that they could go to the edit suite. And they would go as reels of film. So that only copy that you've got of those Rushes is gingerly taken down the, the, the streets of Soho and delivered into an edit suite 
Now bear in mind these are 1,000 foot mags and there's typically a shooting ratio of on or around 15 to 1. So for every minute of finished film you've got 15 minutes of rushes. You can imagine the weight and the volume of this physical, physical media. There used to be a job that's no longer exists anymore now called a rushes runner. And if you were shooting on film in a foreign country that didn't have a lab, you would pay someone to collect those rushes at the end of the day's filming hop on a plane and get back to Heathrow to go to the Pinewood lab. It was, it was that um, analogue as a process. The rushes would be worked on by the editor and the director and eventually you'd get to a thing called picture lock. And at picture lock, you were then, with your finished film that you'd share with the producers, share with the distributors and everyone would sign off. And at that point, you've been working with a very, very dull image. It's a single light process, there's no colour correction, there, there's none of the beauty that the director might have in their, in their mind until it gets into the hand of a colourist or a grader. And at that point, the colourist then tweaks the saturation, tweaks the gamma, starts to make it all look and feel like the film that maybe everyone aspired to at when they started. Now, as a production process, that means you're only getting to see a frame of finished film probably nine to 12 months from the day that you've conceived the, 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 the film's project and sat down with the DOP and talked about the director of photography and talked about how you want to shoot the movie. So imagine that 12, 12 month lifespan. So let's flash forward to how it happens now. On pretty much every set that you're shooting digitally, you'll have a DIT, a digital imaging technician. And that basically pulls together a variety of different areas of expertise. One is the actual rushes data management. Two is the management of the workflow from set to production and into the edit. And lastly, the actual color correction uh, piece of the puzzle. So what does a DIT do? DIT basically manages the digital rushes on set, applies a LUT, which is called a lookup table. That's a pre-designed look and feel that the director of photography and the director have established during pre-production. Applies it to those raw rushes, so everyone on the crew can see live and dynamically what the film is going to look like at the end of the process. They go through a number of checks and balances. So instead of that one reel of film that if ever it got hurt, tarnished or lost, would, would mean the thing would have to be reshot. The first thing that it does is create three, three backup copies. And he, holds one on, he or she holds one on set, one goes to the production, one goes to the edit. So you have this inherent protection within the rushes. It is highly unlikely in this day and age that you would ever have to go back and reshoot a scene because of corruption in the data files. And um, the DIT will then also create the video files that can be piped straight into the edit. Most film shoots now will have a wireless network on set with people looking at what's being shot on either an iPad or an iPhone, and as soon as the director or the script supervisor sends, says to the DIT that that can go to the edit suite, over 4G, you know, a tether to a phone, that is then zapped to the, uh, to the edit, edit suite. So it's compressed that whole process and made it incredibly more efficient. So, and that's all to do with the advent of digital cameras and being able to bring forward in the production life cycle a late stage creative process. In terms of the DIT, and you, you know, if this is, because it was funny, I was in this very same room about six months ago with Bournemouth University, and a couple of their cinematography students stuck their hand up and were asking questions around, when can I expect my first gig? Should I be shooting pop promo? Should I wait until I do commercials? And all of them were thinking they're gonna go straight in as director of photography. The truth is I couldn't give any of those work straight away. If anyone had stuck their hand up and said, I'm interested in being a DIT or doing video assist, I could have got them onto the set of Bond the very next day. It's that immediate. So try and expose some of these other, other roles. A, a, a person that might enjoy digital imaging um, is likely to have a knowledge of physics, probably some level of media studies, knowledge, uh, an eye for colour and photography composition, and definitely strong skills in terms of, com of computing. So what's coming next? Um, that's that one case study. I, I did think about trying to do another one for you, um, but realised I couldn't take as deep a dive if we'd done two. So that's just a, 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 a single one. So what's coming next? What's the rise and scanning on this? Games, games, games and games, 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 games. Um, those of you that are monitoring the press will have seen that Rebellion have set up a new studio up in Oxfordshire. They have the whole IP of the back catalogue of the 2000 AD comics. We're seeing real growth in and um, outside of London in some really odd sort of spurs. So for example, in the gaming community, Leamington Spa is just going gangbusters at the moment. It's, it's a world-class venue. Um, we are getting quicker, faster, better. Just the speed of production is, is accelerating. 
We recognise the rise of the fangs, um, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google, they're here to stay. Whether they are subsumed by bigger organisations, we are yet to see what the Disney rollout looks like in its new form, what Comcast is going to look like. Um, but those big tech giants are around for, for a long time. Virtual reality, augmented reality, so the difference between that virtual, everything that you see within the experience is fabricated. Augmented is when you have elements of live action and you have visual effects elements that are, that are piped in. Um, are now moving into the narrative drama space. We are seeing dramas being written and designed specifically for the immersive world. It's taking a lot of new thinking in terms of those with technical skills and of screen skills we partner with both the BFI and NFTS in terms of access into learning around immersive. Um, I don't know how many of you um, caught the last Star Wars, but we, we saw within that film electronic actors. So Carrie Fisher was replicated, Peter Cushing was replicated. There is a whole question about rights ownership to your likeness and image, um, but the technology is now there to take an actor out of a film completely. Look at the Kevin Spacey incident on um, all the money in the world and put a digital representation of a new actor in there. So that's one of the, 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 the big changes that's coming down the, down the line. Further advancements in motion capture, so that's the process whereby an actor plays the role of a character, normally in a silly like suit with lots of ping pong balls stuck all over them in a special filming environment and their representation of movement and performance is then piped into a computer that picks up those where those ping pong balls are and converts it into, into motion. And if anyone's seen recent films like The Jungle Book, where all of the creatures were created digitally, they've really started to get those difficult things like fur, motion, muscle mass, really worked out and work, worked through. Um, in fact, when we mentioned VR, um, we've just delivered uh, from a commission from the BFI a careers experience that gives the user the opportunity to go on and witness what a working film set looks and sounds like without having to ever take them further away than, than, than being right here and now. Uh, it's based on the Oculus Go headset and I believe Margaret's got one charging up at the moment so maybe over lunch if you want to go and um, immerse yourself in the world of film and TV that might be a great opportunity. Um, but the thing that I wanted to leave as my parting shot before I hand over to, uh, to, to, to Margaret is the real importance to not get blinded by technology. Technology as it's used in the creative industry really is a tool. It's a tool to support creativity. And what we are finding at the moment in, the, in that sort of gold rush to technology, some of the more basic skills are being forgotten to be taught. So for example, if you have a VFX artist who's doing image manipulation on a VFX suite and they're using a stylus and a tablet, if they've never held a pen a, on a piece of paper, you can't suddenly jump them into that knowledge. We're seeing particularly in VFX and animation, the one thing employers are saying is, we love the fact that people are coming through knowing the tech, but the truth is, we want them to be able to draw a round circle freehand, which is a very difficult thing to do. You know, we want them to be able to do characterization, we want them to be able to do those traditional processes. And where technology really, I think, plays an important part in the creative industry is when it adds additionality to that process. It takes that traditional process, that traditional methodology, and just accelerates it or it opens it up. So please, I urge those that you're working with at the moment, please don't let them forget that you know there are some really traditional skills that really must be supported um, whilst we move forward in this technological age. Um, I think that's about my bit. So Margaret, shall I yeah. pop over to you? Thank you. Um, I haven't got an Oscar, I'm sorry, uh, but I'm a little bit more practical. So I head up the careers team, and I suppose I should tell you a bit about myself. I used to work for the BBC for quite a long time. I worked for children's television, but the most important thing why I do what I'm doing now is I headed up BBC Outreach for a while, and I did all of the community engagement for when the BBC moved into Salford. Um, we had 700 um, people there who already worked in Manchester, 700 people moving up from London, but 700 new jobs and we wanted to make them really diverse and we had all sorts of different ways of doing that and that was a brilliant experience of how to get a more diverse workforce and I'm kind of really, really passionate and into that, that kind of thing. So Screen Skills, this is just a very quick guide to what we do with education. W apprenticeships is a really big part of what we do. Um, and we had some amazing news yesterday, sorry, just gonna pop that down there, um, in that 
Um, we lobby for apprenticeship standards, we look at skills shortages, try and make sure apprenticeships and vocational qualifications match those skills gaps. And we had some really good news yesterday from the DCMS in that they're going to allow film and TV to do shared apprenticeships. This means we pay an awful lot of money into the apprenticeship levy and we can't drill most of it down because we can't have apprentices. Our companies um, may be shooting for three months so they can't have an apprentice for a year. <coughs> That's all unlocked and we've now got a pilot running from later this year for 25 new apprentices, which is absolutely <coughs> brilliant news. And as your students go forward, it means that there will be more apprenticeships available. So that's really, really good news, which was announced yesterday, uh, and the DCMS putting £100,000 into that. Um, we accredit um, HE and FE courses, and this means that we look at those courses. Um, industry go in and look at them and make sure they're industry ready, and they look to see whether people can actually get a job at the end of it. Um, lists of those courses are on our website. The FE courses, we're just doing a pilot, but we'll do quite a lot more of those. We've got a really experienced um, vocational team at Screen Skills who actually look at qualifications. Are they going to get people jobs? Are people industry ready? So that's a big part of what we do. We have careers information. Uh, Rochelle, a colleague of mine, and I are here, and we can give you some of our wonderful careers maps, which are really useful things. And um, they map how you start in a career and how you will go. We've just redone completely, for example, the games map. And talking about new technology, on the games map we did it four years ago, and when we do it again, all of a sudden there's a whole new section called eSports, because there weren't jobs in eSports four years ago, and there are now. An example of how things are changing. And um, you saw earlier on that games are overtaking books spend on games, so that's a huge amount. We've got careers resources on there, We've also got comprehensive job profiles and how to get into different jobs, which I know is very useful to a lot of you. We are doing some lesson plans over the summer for primary and secondary, so there will be actual careers lesson plans that you can use um, in the classroom. And we are working with the DCMS and our partners, Creative and Cultural Skills and the Creative Industries Federation on the Creative Careers Campaign and the Creative Careers Programme. And that means that there are several strands to that. We're working with a careers and enterprise company. But the important thing to tell you is in November 18th to 22nd, creative businesses all across the creative industries are opening. Uh, and that will mean there are opportunities for groups of students to um, visit creative businesses, television, film, music, theatre, museums, architecture. All of those partners are working with us. So that's just quite an important thing to look at. Now the creative industry is just to, it's not just really, I mean screen is booming, creative industries are booming, they're worth an awful lot to the government, they did a, a sector deal for the creative industries in March, um, and the, the creative economy is one in 11 jobs in the UK, but the businesses are really small, there's only a few things like in, in screen you've got you know Warner Brothers, you've got the BBC, you've got ITV, but for every one of those, there's a small production company making something really amazing, or a small games company, or even in visual effects, some of the companies are really small, or you've got the really big ones like Framestore and The Mill, and you're meeting Simon later. So a lot, there are a lot of small companies, which makes it very difficult for things like work experience and all that sort of thing. But there are ways of negotiating those, industry, uh, those industries. The government estimates that for the whole of the creative industries, there'll be 600,000 new jobs by 2023, and your students could, can take some of those. Um, working in the industry isn't quite the same as a lot of other things. A lot of the workforce is freelance. Um, indies make most of the television content. There's only one director on a film. As Gareth says, you can't just walk in and, and do that sort of thing. But when we recruit for our trainee finder scheme, we recruit by department. So we recruit production office trainees, makeup trainees, camera trainees. So th those are where the jobs are. And we need people, we need electricians, we need plasterers, we need people to make props. So it's not just all of those grades that, that uh, not everybody is a director or assistant director. There are lots of other things. And if you want to know who it takes to make a film, or which companies make that film or television program, you will hear me more than once in this presentation, read the credits. You, then you will see where the work is. The people on the credits, the companies on the credits, have the work. Um, TV production. Um, 
Have I Got News For You um, goes out on the BBC. It's actually made at ITV Studios by a company called Hattrick, which is one of the only indies that hasn't been taken over, actually. Who makes Bake Off? Does anybody know? Nobody ever does. All that fuss about it going to Channel 4. It's made by a really big production company called Love Productions, uh, which is not truly an indie anymore because Sky owns 70% of it. You will see Graham Norton on a Friday night, goes out on the BBC. He made his own company called So Television. He's also got So Radio. But a few years ago, that was uh, the, the majority shareholding in that company is now owned by ITV Studios. So the ownership of television and film is really very complex. Three of 2018's top five grossing films at the UK box office were made in the UK. Avengers Infinity War. So who made that? Marvel Studios made it, but they're part of Disney and it was distributed by Disney. A lot of it was shot in Scotland. Mamma Mia. So four or five production companies doing that. Little Star, Legendary, Perfect World. Um, it was shot at Shepperton. Uh, the, the visual effects were done by a company called DNEG, which is a big visual effects company. Um, but there was a company called Playtone involved in that. You've probably never heard of them. So a lot of these companies are people you may never have heard of, and yet they have work. Um, Bohemian Rhapsody um, uh, was, is a 20th century Fox film, but a lot of it was done in Britain. And there's a British company called GK Films, which again, you might not have heard of, that was involved in that production. So it's about doing research. Who are the companies that are making these things? The BBC and ITV don't really make very much. ITV Studios and Shiver make things. BBC Studios make things. But all the BBC make now, for example, um, is, is, is sport and children's. That's just about it, really, and news. Um, working in the industry isn't quite the same as anything else. Um, we deal with a lot of parents and a lot of teachers. And everybody says oh, it's a bit arty farty, it's not a proper job. Actually, there are proper jobs, there are proper pathways in. Um, it's not um, quite the same as, as other things because of the short term project nature, but an awful lot of people make a really good living. Um, you've got to be able to network and promote yourself, and you will probably have to work freelance. It's just the way it is. Um, we do um, research. And this is really interesting, it's all on the website. We do a quarterly skills barometer. So the first one is the three months up to October 2018 that we did, where 58% of people said business activity was increasing. It was down to 39% in January, but that's really due to Brexit. The, the biggest influence on that was Brexit and political uncertainty. And in October, 86% of our, our companies that we surveyed reported difficulties in recruiting staff. Um, and getting the right skills. It's down 68% in January, but you're talking about Christmas. And, and the reasons they give are competition from inside the sector and a low number of skilled applicants. We also identify skills shortages. Here are some of them. Production accountants, line producers, location managers, and the, those very important ones that we've mentioned several times in visual effects and games, animators, programmers who actually code for games and visual effects, and um, creature artists. I mean, these are people who do, you know, sort of who create the creatures in animated films. A brilliant job uh, for, for people who have that sort of aptitude. Um, the solutions are our businesses are suggesting bursaries, we're doing that. Improved careers education, we're doing that. And the improved relevance of education and vocational training, we are doing all of these things to try and improve the pathways in. Um, so we did an employer survey with more than 400 employers. Uh, the results just came out um, now, it was up to April, and 28% of the sector is self-employed, but in film and TV that's 50%. But the weekly pay is, it, this uh, is sort of myth that it's not particularly well paid, it's higher than the general economy, apart from film distribution, which is cinemas and that sort of thing. We are improving in diversity. We're a bit whiter, a bit um, more male, and a bit younger than most of the workforce, but we are making real progress on that, and that there are so many initiatives, particularly in London, which is a really good place to be. And it reaffirmed, um, the, the bigger sample reaffirmed the shortages in animation, visual effects, and games as well. Just last thing, how do you get in? You need the right course. Um, look at placements on a course. 
Work experience is a really difficult thing for some of our companies. The BBC and ITV and Warner Brothers and some of the bigger companies do work experience, but it is quite difficult for some of the smaller companies. Our Creative Careers campaign is trying to improve that. We're working with Speakers for Schools Next Gen to try and improve work experience. There are a lot of brilliant trainee schemes. We have Trainee Finder. Uh, the BBC has a production trainee scheme. Channel 4 does it. And there are increasingly some very good <coughs> trainee schemes out there, but you have to do your research. Some people just apply for an entry-level job or turn up and be a runner, or they get work <coughs> um, in other ways. Um, our students have started their career. We, we, we've got a lot of things to help people along. It's not that they're going to get stuck. We've got bursaries, we've got training, and we've got schemes to help get people to the next level. Um, you need a good CV, and people can start doing it now. A lot of you are teaching A-level and, and, and 16 to 18. So they should have a CV now or a portfolio. They should be doing it now. They need to think of who will read it or see it. I've looked through thousands of these in previous life and you need to stand out from the crowd a little bit and think of who's reading it. Although you're promoting yourself, a lot of people don't think of me sitting there at 11 o'clock at night um, thinking I need to give every one of these young people a chance, but I'm really tired and I've read 20 that sound exactly the same. Um, I mean, that's just what happens. Um, you, how do you get experience to put on your CV and how do you get experience because you're not going to get in as a runner if you've already done something that's great people should be making their own ton content there's a BFI film academy which you'll hear about today there's interfilm clubs which you can run in school um, anybody who's done student school radio TV publications films people who volunteer for that sort of thing are more likely to get the jobs in the end you should always read the credits and always do your research. And here are a few organisations. The ones on the left um, are all screen organisations. The ones on the right are organisations that are quite useful for the whole of the creative industries. If you've got any questions, we've got a little stand outside. And my lovely colleague, Rochelle, is with us as well. OK, thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. We've, we've got a little bit of time, if, um, because Margaret and Gareth are still here. Would, would, do you want to come up and see whether people have got any specific questions that come out of your out of your two presentations? Thank you very much for those. What's that? Guys, yeah. <laughs> Who has a question? You can call it out as well. So, yeah, we don't need a microphone. Um, a big part of uh, getting kids onto our film and media courses is our kind of open evenings when uh, I think one of you mentioned about parents who are, yes. we struggle to kind of convince them that these amazing jobs are out there mm -hmm. and that our s subjects go, like you said, with like physics and photography mm -hmm. and maths. Any yes. tips on kind of, um, you know, how we can really push, you know, helping the parents to understand why their kids should, should do our I mean, I think, I think one of the problems is that, that there is a perception that when we talk about um, jobs in the screen industries, we just look at what we know as the above the line grade, so writer, producer and director. I spoke at a school in North London just um, just last year and um, shared the anecdote on the King's Speech, I employed 456 people. There's one director, one writer, four producers and everyone else had proper jobs. And those proper <laughs> jobs now are starting to get more talked about. There's better training available, there's better pathways and signposting in. So I think it's to encourage people to look beyond those lofty grades. Um, you know, I, I've spent time recently with a company called Palace Scenery. Palace basically build the sets on Bond. And speaking to the company over at Steve Bowen, you know, he doesn't need someone with a film degree that can quote Battleship Potemkin. He needs someone that can drive a nail in straight. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's broadening the, the opportunity by making it clearer that there are all of those other and different jobs. And I think. Part of that, which, which Shaney touched on here, I think there is a misconception further that in the process of trying to stand out from the crowd, we expect everyone in the screen industries to be like the cast of Glee. These high energy, high fiving, cartwheel turning um, sort of bundles of energy. And the truth is, is that there is so many broad different jobs within our world and some people that might want quiet, more contained, detail work there's opportunities there. People that love being in part of a big team, there's opportunities there. You know, so it's trying to break down those boundaries. A, that there are different types of job, and B, that we really need different types of people to fill those jobs. 
Uh, I mean, for example, production accountant or line producer or production manager comes up a lot. And if somebody is quite good at maths and spreadsheets, ideal job for them, and we're really short of those people. So there are, there are an awful lot of jobs that are really suitable. And I find when I talk to parents that those figures about, there are five times as many jobs in the creative industries over the years 2011 to 2016, which are the latest government figures. And <coughs> the economy in screen is growing more than twice as fast. Jobs in screen are growing more than twice as fast as the general economy. And as Gareth says, not all of those jobs are um, directors and producers and writers. A lot of those jobs are the other grades and the other people, and a lot of those jobs are technical. So do, you, do you have a presentation that she can maybe show? Because you're both very charismatic. Oh, thank you. You can stay. We're engaged. Uh, yes, yeah. Now, if we, I mean, Margaret and Rochelle are around for a good part of the day. If we could get your details, we could see if there's a some yeah. machine. I mean, one of the things that we're, we're doing, which is rolling out later in the year, actually away from London and the South East in recognition of some of those other jobs that are going underserved at the moment, is the Centre of Excellence that we've announced um, in, in, in Yorkshire. And that's a coming together of both the BFI, ourselves, um, Screen Yorkshire is a local regional agency and the, and the NFTS and the actual grades that we're looking to deliver aren't those common things that you can currently find in HE and FE, it's plastering, it's carpentry, it's electrical um, so we can definitely share something mm. for now but we'd also just say you know look to those other things that we're, we're doing because as these new initiatives roll out like the apprenticeships that Margaret mentioned got announced yesterday at Pinewood um, you know, it's really important that you stay current with those changes because we're just moving at such a fast pace. Yeah. And, and the reason we're filming is because CLC are going to make the materials available. Do you yeah, want to say a little bit about that, Sarah? On our Tech Pathways London website. So that so it'll reach lots more people, and you'll be able to download and, and, and play them back, um, and maybe use them if you mm -hmm. want to. If you want to talk to parents <coughs> or, or to students. Yeah. Another question. Um, I was just wondering, is there any? Um, Opportunity for anybody from Springs Hills or you know or, or similar organisations that could come into a school where we would have maybe enough timetable there or something where a whole year group do workshops and things around um, opportunities within the screen industries to make you know to look more depth at more depth in how mm. physics or how maths or how these things can. Cause it, it's, you know, you can talk about it, but it's actually the doing and seeing, isn't it, that yeah. actually puts it into kids' minds, and then they go home and we, talk we, to their parents about the great things they've done. We cover the whole of the UK, and we. Um, I started with a team of, there were three of us, and now there are five or six of us, but we can't get to every school. We're invited to go to a lot of places, but we do go to a lot of bigger things like this if we can. And if we have a volunteer um, among our Screen Skills staff, who lives near a school and we get a request, we can give them a presentation to take in. So we do try and get out as much as we can, but we can't get everywhere. I mean, I'd, I'd say make the, make the request, but please understand that we're trying to service a lot of those. I mean, I've yeah. done two schools the, this week, and I've actually, as Margaret said, I've got a, a, um, a colleague stepping in for me on Monday with a, a school that I can't get to because I'm, I'm elsewhere. Yeah. So we will always try and service those individual re requests. And if we can't attend in person, then we'll definitely signpost to, to resource. One of the things that we're developing in light with the VFX and animation shortfall at the moment is a, uh, a, a, a piece of work where we are going to enlist 200 VFX workers who are within a sort of three to four year period of graduation and equip them with resource so they, they can go back into their old schools, their old colleges. Um, because there's a real desire, I mean, there's a real desire. And one of the reasons Margaret and I do the job we do is that we want to make sure we've got that next mm. generation coming through. So it's not for lack of desire, it's sometimes just a resource question. And, um, and next term, we're working with Inspiring the Future um, to get, to mobilise our industry and get our employers to go into schools as well. Um, that's not quite up yet, but that'll be next term. And maybe for schools, if we collaborate with other schools maybe in the local areas and get... Yeah, if we've got a group, it makes it much there. easier. Mm. Yeah. If, to, if, to do. If, you, if you do have, if there's a group of centres who are you know within a couple of miles of each other, it's easier in big cities, I guess, and you can get a venue yeah. and get the venue to open up a, and have some uh, maybe a media careers day, then, then that's the, an opportunity to get a whole range of people to come in and speak. Mm. Um, it's more work for you. Uh, you could maybe do that through the Media Education Association, if you know the MEA. Um, and that's the kind of thing the MEA really wants to be able to do. So if you join up with them online and find like-minded people, you might be able to get uh, get a kind of careers day like that off the ground. So, yeah,
Uh, yeah, it's more potentially a bit of a discussion point. You spoke about the skills shortage uh, in the industry as uh, the reason why young people don't get jobs, I'm sure. And else is a teacher in the school is aware, teaching media film, very hard to get student numbers, etc. But combined with losing things like art is getting detailed down the curriculum. And then yeah. I'm thinking if anyone's seen the documentary Side by Side that Keanu Reeves did where he interviews a lot of directors and they talk about the, the rise of digital, for example, has actually led to a skill shortage because filmmaking's become so much easier, which is obviously a good thing, but I wonder that's just themselves. Do you think that is a, a great thing that students aren't necessarily learning the craft how it was done before? Well, and I think also kind of the impact that those other elements have on the curriculum. I mean, in terms of digital breaking open opportunity, obviously that's something to embrace. And you know, I know that when I was going through to tell my stories, I had to pre-book equipment, and there'll be a great sort of demand on that equipment. Whereas now, you know, many people can sit at home either on a very basic laptop or with their smartphone or other device actually tell their story. So I think we have to embrace that. I think the problem that, that we face is that there is an inherent tension between social enterprise and opportunity and genuine workforce readiment. Um, and one of the problems that we face at the moment is that with the proliferation of courses around the sort of generalist media space, um, the knowledge gap between finishing that type of generalist course and then going into a very specific job or grade requires a sort of 18 months transition that the employers don't at the moment feel that they can wholly bear the responsibility of. So when we're talking about our accreditation, one of the things that we are looking at with those courses is do they offer workplace learning? Do they have industry guest speakers coming in? Is there generally that dovetailing between the real world of work and the educational environment that the, 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 the teaching takes place in? Um, so I, I think it is, it, it is a bit of an issue um, and there is good work being done to try and sort of bridge that gap between the, the, the two things. But with regard to your, your students, you know, I'd really actively encourage them when they start to look at those later life decisions to really interrogate what they're going to get out of that particular course. And we have seen a bit of a shift recently away from degree level learning in our space. I think we've become mm -hmm. a bit more accepting of um, vocational learning or actually just going straight into the world of work. So it's trying to create that sort of responsibility on the learner as well. You know, it's not just on your shoulders that that person that's expressed an interest goes on and has a, has a career. They've got to take responsibility themselves. And, and you, you write about art and design. I mean, uh, apparently in London, uh, according to Birkbeck University, there are 61,000 unfilled art and design jobs in Greater London because um, the, the, the art and design skills across the whole of creative, because they're coming out of level three, there is a bit of a problem there, we know that, yeah. So. One of the, the conference last year or the year before, we had somebody from a VFX house who said he, he needed somebody to, who was able to do computer graphics, he couldn't find somebody with the right skills, he ended up with a, a graduate from Brazil. Yeah. And he said at the same time, I reckon I could teach compositing to a 14 year old in 10 weeks. So the, the, there are opportunities that people just don't know, you know how, to, how to fill them, how to find them, um, and how to, match the, how to match the skills and the people who've got the qualifications. I um, well, was talking this morning, but I feel because um, a lot of the subjects now, especially creative ones, are exam driven. So you've lost the whole practical element. So it makes it, it, sorry, it, makes it difficult for students when they want to move on to like, those courses. Yes, it does. For example, a media studies teacher now, it's 70% theory, so it's a lot of it is a theoretical base, knowing about theorists and all those things, so you kind of take away the actual practical media elements. So. And it's that element that for a lot of people, I mean, my own personal story, that's where it came alive for me, picking up a camera, getting to actually <coughs> do stuff, it wasn't the chalk and talk, lesson, learn, lesson mm. learning of the theory. Um, so yeah. it's whether, but it's whether those opportunities that can be created outside of the school environment. It's, so it's the volunteering, mm. people who volunteer, you know, and if you volunteer for community films, community projects, hospital radio, I started in radio, you know, I started doing community hospital sort of radio, that's how I started off, and then I ended up doing all sorts of stuff, but, you know, just volunteering to do something like that, or just getting involved in some films, I mentored a student who is now in his first year and from a very disadvantaged background and he has been making stuff, you know, volunteering to make stuff for local companies since he was 15 and he's doing really well. But that's quite hard work, but the volunteering bit of it and getting some experience however you get it is, is quite important, I think. And, and I know there's not as much of it in the classroom now, which is sad, but probably a lot of people have to get it outside, outside the anyway. classroom a little bit. 
Can we thank Gareth and Margaret? Thank you very much.